Dracula by Bram Stoker. Chapter thirteen. Dr. Seward's diary continued. The funeral was arranged for the next succeeding day, so that Lucy and her mother might be buried together. I attended to all the ghastly formalities, and the urbane undertaker proved that his staff was afflicted, or blessed, with something of his own obsequious suavity. Even the woman who performed the last offices for the dead remarked to me in a confidential, brother-professional way, when she had come out from the death-chamber, "'She makes a very beautiful corpse, sir. "'It's quite a privilege to attend on her. "'It's not too much to say that she will do credit to our establishment.' "'I noticed that Van Hilsing never kept far away. "'This was possible from the disordered state of things in the household. "'There were no relatives at hand, "'and as Arthur had to be back the next day, to attend at his father's funeral, we were unable to notify any one who should have been bidden. Under the circumstances, Van Helsing and I took it upon ourselves to examine papers, etc. He insisted upon looking over Lucy's papers himself. I asked him why, for I feared that he, being a foreigner, might not be quite aware of English legal requirements and so might, in ignorance, make some unnecessary trouble. He answered me, I know, I know, you forget that I am a lawyer as well as a doctor, but this is not altogether for the law. You knew that when you avoided the coroner. I have more than him to avoid. There may be papers more such as this. As he spoke, he took from his pocket-book the memorandum which had been in Lucy's breast, and which she had torn in her sleep. "'When you find anything of the solicitor, who is for the late Mrs. Westenra, seal all her papers, and write him to-night. For me, I watch here in the room, and in Miss Lucy's old room all night, and I myself search for what may be.' It is not well that her very thoughts go into the hands of strangers. I went on with my part of the work, and in another half-hour had found the name and address of Mrs. Westenra's solicitor, and had written to him. All the poor lady's papers were in order. Explicit directions regarding the place of burial were given. I had hardly sealed the letter when— to my surprise, Van Helsing walked into the room, saying, "'Can I help you, friend John? I am free, and, if I may, my service is to you.' Uh, "'Have you got what you looked for?' I asked. To which he replied, "'I did not look for any specific thing. I only hoped to find, and find I have, all that there was.' only some letters and a few memoranda, and a diary new begun. But I have them here, and we shall for the present say nothing of them. I shall see that poor lad to-morrow evening, and with his sanction I shall use some. When we had finished the work in hand, he said to me, And now, friend John, I think we may to bed. We want some sleep, both you and I, and rest to recuperate. Tomorrow we shall have much to do, but for the tonight there is no need of us, alas. Before turning in we went to look at poor Lucy. The undertaker had certainly done his work well, for the room was turned into a small chapelle ardent. There was a wilderness of beautiful white flowers, and death was made as little repulsive as might be. The end of the winding-sheet was laid over the face. 
when the professor bent over and turned it gently back, we both started at the beauty before us. The tall wax candles showing a sufficient light to note it well. All Lucy's loveliness had come back to her in death, and the hours that had passed, instead of leaving traces of decays of facing fingers, had but restored the beauty of life, till positively I could not believe my eyes that I was looking at a corpse. The professor looked sternly grave. He had not loved her as I had, and there was no need for tears in his eyes. He said to me, Remain till I return, and left the room. He came back with a handful of wild garlic from the box waiting in the hall, but which had not been opened, and placed the flowers amongst the others, on and around the bed. Then he took from his neck, inside his collar, a little gold crucifix, and placed it over the mouth. He restored the sheet to its place, and we came away. I was undressing in my own room, when, with the premonitory tap at the door, he entered, and at once began to speak. "'Tomorrow I want you to bring me, before night, a set of post-mortem knives. "'Must we make an autopsy?' I asked. Mm, "'Yes and no. I want to operate, but not what you think. "'Let me tell you now, but not a word to another. "'I want to cut off her head and take out her heart.' Ha. You as a surgeon, and so shocked. You whom I have seen with no tremble of hand or heart do operations of life and death that make the rest shudder. Oh, but I must not forget, my dear John, that you loved her, and I have not forgotten it, for is I that shall operate, and you must not help. I would like to do it to-night, but for Arthur I must not. He will be free after his father's funeral to-morrow, and he will want to see her, to see it. Then, when she is coffined, ready for the next day, you and I shall come when all sleep. We shall unscrew the coffin lid, and shall do our operation, and then place all, so that none know, save we alone. But why do it at all? The girl is dead. Why mutilate her poor body without need? And if there is no necessity for a post-mortem, and nothing to gain by it, no good to her, to us, to science, to human knowledge, why do it? Without such, it is monstrous." For answer, he put his hand on my shoulder, and said with infinite tenderness, Friend John, I pity your poor bleeding heart, and I love you the more because it does so bleed. If I could, I would take on myself the burden that you do bear. But these are things that you know not, but that you shall know, and bless me for knowing, though they are not pleasant things. John, my child, you have been my friend now many years, and yet did you ever know me to do any without good cause? I may err, I am but man, but I believe in all I do. Was it not for these causes that you send for me when the great trouble came? Yes, were you not amazed, nay, horrified, when I would not let Arthur kiss his love, though she was dying, and snatched him away by all my strength? Yes, and yet you saw how she thanked me, with her so beautiful dying eyes, her voice too so weak, and she kissed my rough old hand, and 
bless me. Yes. And did you not hear me swear promise to her that so she closed her eyes, grateful? Yes. Well, I have good reason now for all I want to do. You have for many years trust me. You have believed me weeks past, when there be things so strange that you might have well doubt. Believe me yet a little, friend John. If you trust me not, then I must tell what I think, and that is not perhaps well. And if I work as work I shall, no matter trust or no trust, without my friend trust in me, I work with heavy heart, and feel, oh, so lonely, when I want all help and courage that may be. He paused a moment, and went on solemnly. Friend John, there are strange and terrible days before us. Let us not be two, but one, that so we work to a good end. Will you not have faith in me? I took his hand, and promised him. I held my door open as he went away and watched him go to his room and close the door. As I stood without moving, I saw one of the maids pass silently along the passage. She had her back to me, so did not see me, and go into the room where Lucy lay. The sight touched me. Devotion is so rare, and we are so grateful to those who show it unasked to those we love. Here was a poor girl, putting aside the terrors which she naturally had of death, to go watch alone by the bier of the mistress whom she loved, so that the poor clay might not be lonely till laid to eternal rest. I must have slept long and soundly, for it was broad daylight when Van Helsing waked me by coming into my room. He came over to my bedside and said, You need not trouble about the knives. We shall not do it. Why not? I asked, for his solemnity of the night before had greatly impressed me. Because, he said sternly, it is too late. Or too early. See? Here he held up the little golden crucifix. This was stolen in the night. How stolen? I asked in wonder, since you have it now. Because I get it back from the worthless wretch who stole it, from the woman who robbed the dead and the living. Her punishment will surely come, but not through me. She knew not altogether what she did, and thus unknowing. She only stole. Now we must wait. He went away on the word, leaving me with a new mystery to think of, a new puzzle to grapple with. The forenoon was a dreary time, but at noon the solicitor came. Mr. Marquand, of Holman Sons Marquand and Litterdale. He was very genial, and very appreciative of what we had done, and took off our hands all cares as to details. During lunch he told us that Mrs. Westenra had for some time expected sudden death from her heart, and had put her affairs in absolute order. He informed us that, with the exception of a certain entailed property of Lucy's father, which now, in default of direct issue, went back to a distant branch of the family, the whole estate, real and personal, was left absolutely to Arthur Holmwood. When he had told us so much, he went on, Frankly, we did our best to prevent such a testamentary disposition, and pointed out certain contingencies that might leave her daughter either penniless or 
not so free as she should be to act regarding a matrimonial alliance. Indeed, we pressed the matter so far that we almost came into collision, for she asked us if we were or were not prepared to carry out her wishes. Of course, we had then no alternative but to accept. We were right, in principle, and ninety-nine times out of a hundred we should have proved, by the logic of events, the accuracy of our judgment. Frankly, however, I must admit that in this case any other form of disposition would have rendered impossible the carrying out of her wishes, for by her predeceasing her daughter the latter would have come into possession of the property, and even had she only survived her mother by five minutes, her property would, in case there were no will, and a will was a practical impossibility in such a case, have been treated at her decease as her intestacy, in which case Lord Galdaming, though so dear a friend, would have had no claim in the world, and the inheritors, being remote, would not be likely to abandon their just rights, for sentimental reasons, regarding an entire stranger. I assure you, my dear sirs, I am rejoiced at the result, perfectly rejoiced. He was a good fellow, but his rejoicing at the one little part in which he was officially interested of so great a tragedy was an object lesson in the limitations of sympathetic understanding. He did not remain long, but said he would look in later in the day and see Lord Galdeming. His coming, however, had been a certain comfort to us, since it assured us that we should not have to dread hostile criticism as to any of our acts. Arthur was expected at five o'clock, so a little before that time we visited the death chamber. It was so in very truth, for now both mother and daughter lay in it. The undertaker, true to his craft, had made the best display he could of his works, and there was a mortuary air about the place that lowered our spirits at once. Van Helsing ordered the former arrangement to be adhered to, explaining that, as Lord Galdaming was coming very soon, it would be less harrowing to his feelings to see all that was left of his fiancée, quite alone. The undertaker seemed shocked at his own stupidity, and exerted himself to restore things to the condition in which we left them the night before so that when Arthur came, such shocks to his feeling as we could avoid were saved. Poor fellow! He looked desperately sad and broken. Even his stalwart manhood seemed to have shrunk somewhat under the strain of his much-tried emotions. He had, I knew, been very genuinely and devotedly attached to his father, and to lose him and at such a time was a bitter blow to him. With me he was warm as ever, and to Van Helsing he was sweetly courteous, but I could not help seeing that there was some constraint with him. The professor noticed it too, and motioned me to bring him upstairs. I did so, and left him at the door of the room, as I felt he would like to be quite alone with her, but he took my arm and led me in, saying huskily, "'You love her, too, old fellow. She told me all about it, and there was no friend had a closer place in her heart than you. I don't know how to thank you for all you have done for her. I can't think yet.' Here he suddenly broke down, and threw his arms round my shoulders, and laid his head on my breast, crying, "'Oh, Jack, Jack, what shall I do? The whole of life, 
seems gone from me all at once, and there is nothing in the wide world for me to live for. I comforted him as well as I could. In such cases men do not need much expression. A grip of the hand, the tightening of an arm over the shoulder, a sob in unison, are expressions of sympathy dear to a man's heart. I stood still and silent till his sobs died away, and then I said softly to him, Come and look at her. Together we moved over to the bed, and I lifted the lawn from her face. God, how beautiful she was! Every hour seemed to be enhancing her loveliness. It frightened and amazed me somewhat. And as for Arthur, he fell to trembling, and finally was shaken with doubt, as with an ague. At last, after a long pause, he said to me in a faint whisper, Jack, is she really dead? I assured him sadly that it was so, and went on to suggest, for I felt that such a horrible doubt should not have life for a moment longer than I could help it, that it often happened that after death faces become softened and even resolved into their youthful beauty, that this was especially so when death had been preceded by any acute or prolonged suffering. I seemed to quite do away with any doubt, and after kneeling beside the couch for a while, and looking at her lovingly and long, he turned aside. I told him that that must be good-bye, as the coffin had to be prepared. So he went back and took her dead hand in his, and kissed it, and bent over and kissed her forehead. He came away, fondly looking back over his shoulder at her as he came. I left him in the drawing-room and told Van Helsing that he had said good-bye, so the latter went to the kitchen to tell the undertaker's men to proceed with the preparations and to screw up the coffin. When we came out of the room again, I told him of Arthur's question, and he replied, I am not surprised. Just now, I doubted for a moment myself. We all dined together, and I could see that poor Art was trying to make the best of things. Van Helsing had been silent all dinner-time, but when we had lit our cigars, he said, Lord! But Arthur interrupted him. No, no, not that, for God's sake, not yet, at any rate. Forgive me, sir. I did not mean to speak offensively. It is only because my loss is so recent. The professor answered very sweetly. I only used that name because I was in doubt. I must not call you Mr. And I have grown to love you, yes, my dear boy, to love you as Arthur. Arthur held out his hand and took the old man's warmly. "'Call me what you will,' he said. "'I hope I may always have the title of a friend. "'And let me say that I am at a loss for words "'to thank you for your goodness to my poor dear.' "'He paused a moment and went on. "'I know that she understood your goodness "'even better than I do, "'and if I was rude, or in any way wanting at that time you acted so. You remember. The professor nodded. You must forgive me. He answered with a grave kindness. I know it was hard for you to quite trust me, then, for to trust such violence needs to understand, and I take it that you do not that you cannot trust me now, for you do not yet understand, and there may be more times when I shall want you to trust when you cannot, and may not, 
and must not yet understand. But the time will come, when your trust shall be whole and complete in me, and when you shall understand as though the sunlight himself shone through. Then you shall bless me from first to last for your own sake, and for the sake of others, and for her dear sake, to whom I swore to protect. And indeed, indeed, sir, said Arthur warmly, I shall in all ways trust you. I know and believe you have a very noble heart, and you are Jack's friend, and you are hers. You shall do what you like. The professor cleared his throat a couple of times, as though about to speak, and finally said, <clears throat> May I ask you something now? Certainly. You know that Mrs. Westenra left you all her property. No, poor dear, I never thought of it. And as it is all yours, you have a right to deal with it as you will. I want you to give me permission to read all Miss Lucy's papers and letters. Believe me, it is no idle curiosity. I have a motive of which, be sure, she would have approved. I have them all here. I took them before we knew that all was yours, so that no strange hand might touch them. No strange eye look through words into her soul. I shall keep them, if I may. Even you may not see them yet, but I shall keep them safe. No word shall be lost, and in good time I shall give them back to you. It is a hard thing that I ask, but you will do it, will you not, for Lucy's sake? Arthur spoke out heartily, like his old self. Dr. Van Helsing, you may do what you will. I feel that in saying this I am doing what my dear one would have approved. I shall not trouble you with questions till the time comes. The old professor stood up, as he said solemnly, And you are right. There will be pain for us all. But it will not be all pain, nor will this pain be the last. We, and you too, you most of all, dear boy, will have to pass through the bitter water before we reach the sweet. But we must be brave of heart, and unselfish, and do our duty, and all will be well. I slept on a sofa in Arthur's room that night. Van Helsing did not go to bed at all. He went to and fro, as if patrolling the house, and was never out of sight of the room where Lucy lay in her coffin, strewn with the wild garlic flowers, which sent through the odor of lily and rose a heavy, overpowering smell into the night. Mina Harker's Journal 22 September In the train to Exeter, Jonathan sleeping. It seems only yesterday that the last entry was made, and yet how much between then, in Whitby and all the world before me, Jonathan away and no news of him, and now, married to Jonathan, Jonathan a solicitor, a partner, rich, master of his business, Mr. Hawkins dead and buried and Jonathan with another attack that may harm him. Some day he may ask me about it. Down it all goes. I am rusty in my shorthand. See what unexpected prosperity does for us. So it may be as well to freshen it up again with an exercise, anyhow. The service was very simple and very solemn. There were only ourselves and the servants there, one or two old friends of his from Exeter, his London agent, and a gentleman representing Sir John Paxton, the president of the Incorporated Law Society. Jonathan and I stood hand in hand, and we felt that our best and dearest friend was gone from us. We came back to town quietly, taking a bus to Hyde Park Corner. 
Jonathan thought it would interest me to go to the row for a while, so we sat down. But there were very few people there, and it was sad-looking and desolate to see so many empty chairs. It made us think of the empty chair at home. So we got up and walked down Piccadilly. Jonathan was holding me by the arm, the way he used to in the old days before I went to school. I felt it very improper, for you can't go on for some years teaching etiquette and decorum to other girls without the pedantry of it biting into yourself a bit. But it was Jonathan, and he was my husband, and we didn't know anybody who saw us, and we didn't care if they did. So on we walked. I was looking at a very beautiful girl, in a big cartwheel hat, sitting in a Victoria outside Giuliano's, when I felt Jonathan clutch my arm so tight that he hurt me, and he said under his breath, "'My God!' I am always anxious about Jonathan, for I fear that some nervous fit may upset him again. So I turned to him quickly and asked him what it was that disturbed him. He was very pale, and his eyes seemed bulging out, as half in terror and half in amazement he gazed at a tall thin man with a beaky nose and black moustache and pointed beard, who was also observing the pretty girl. He was looking at her so hard that he did not see either of us, and so I had a good view of him. His face was not a good face. It was hard, and cruel, and sensual, and big white teeth that looked all the whiter because his lips were so red, were pointed like an animal's. Jonathan kept staring at him, till I was afraid he would notice. I feared he might take it ill. He looked so fierce and nasty. I asked Jonathan why he was disturbed, and he answered, evidently thinking that I knew as much about it as he did, "'Do you see who it is?' "'No, dear,' I said. "'I don't know him. Who is it?' His answer seemed to shock and thrill me, for it was said as if he did not know that it was me, Mina, to whom he was speaking. It is the man himself. The poor dear was evidently terrified at something, very greatly terrified. I do believe that if he had not had me to lean on and to support him, he would have sunk down. He kept staring. A man came out of the shop with a small parcel, and gave it to the lady, who then drove off. The dark man kept his eyes fixed on her and when the carriage moved up Piccadilly, he followed in the same direction, and hailed a hansom. Jonathan kept looking after him, and said, as if to himself, "'I believe it is the Count, but he has grown young. My God, if this be so! Oh, my God, my God, if I only knew, if only I knew!' He was distressing himself so much that I feared to keep his mind on the subject by asking him many questions, so I remained silent. I drew away quietly, and he, holding my arm, came easily. We walked a little further, and then went in and sat for a while in the green park. It was a hot day for autumn, and there was a comfortable seat in a shady place. After a few minutes staring at nothing, Jonathan's eyes closed, and he went quickly into a sleep with his head on my shoulder. I thought it was the best thing for him, so did not disturb him. In about twenty minutes he woke up and said to me quite cheerfully, "'Why, Mina, have you been asleep? Oh, do forgive me for being so rude. Come, and we'll have a cup of tea somewhere.' He had evidently forgotten all about the dark stranger, as in his illness he had forgotten all that this episode had reminded him of. I don't like this lapsing into forgetfulness. It may make or continue some injury to the brain. I must not ask him, for fear I shall do more harm than good, but I must somehow learn the fact of his journey abroad. The time has come, I fear, when I must open the parcel, and know what is written. Oh, Jonathan, you will, I know, forgive me if I do wrong. But it is for your own dear sake. Later. A sad homecoming in every way. The house empty of the dear soul who was so good to us. Jonathan still pale and dizzy under a slight relapse of his malady. And now a telegram from Van Helsing, whoever he may be. You will be grieved to hear that Mrs. Weston died five days ago, and that Lucy died the day before yesterday. They were both buried to-day. Oh, what a wealth of sorrow in a few words! Poor Mrs. Westenra! Poor Lucy! Gone! Gone, never to return to us! And poor, poor Arthur, to have lost such a sweetness out of his life! God help us to bear all our troubles! Dr. Seward's Diary Continued 22 September It is all over. Arthur has gone back to Ring, and has taken Quincy Morris with him. What a fine fellow is Quincy! I believe in my heart of hearts, 
that he suffered as much about Lucy's death as any of us, but he bore himself through it like a moral viking. If America can go on breeding men like that, she will be a power in the world indeed. Van Helsing is lying down, having a rest preparatory to his journey. He goes to Amsterdam to-night, but says he returns to-morrow night, that he only wants to make some arrangements which can only be made personally. He is to stop with me, then, if he can. He says he has work to do in London, which may take him some time. Poor old fellow! I fear that the strain of the past week has broken down even his iron strength, all the time of the burial. He was, I could see, putting some terrible restraint on himself. When it was all over, we were standing beside Arthur, who, poor fellow, was speaking of his part in the operation, where his blood had been transfused to his Lucy's veins. I could see Van Helsing's face grow white and purple by turns. Arthur was saying that he felt since then as if they two had been really married, and that she was his wife in the sight of God. None of us said a word of the other operations, and none of us ever shall. Arthur and Quincy went away together to the station, and Van Helsing and I came on here. The moment we were alone in the carriage, he gave way to a regular fit of hysterics. He has denied to me since that it was hysterics, and insisted that it was only his sense of humor asserting itself under very terrible conditions. He laughed till he cried, and I had to draw down the blinds, lest any one should see us and misjudge. And then he cried till he laughed again, and laughed and cried together just as a woman does. I tried to be stern with him, as one is to a woman under the circumstances, but it had no effect. Men and women are so different in manifestations of nervous strength or weakness. Then, when his face grew grave and stern again, I asked him why his mirth, and why at such a time. His reply was in a way characteristic of him, for it was logical and forceful, and mysterious. He said, Ah, you don't comprehend, friend John. Do not think that I am not sad, though I laugh. See, I have cried even when the laugh did choke me, but no more think that I am all sorry when I cry, for the laugh he come just the same. Keep it always with you, that laughter, who knock at your door, and say, May I come in? Is not true laughter. No, he is a king, and he come when and how he like. He ask no person. He choose no time of suitability. He say, I am here. Behold, in example, I grieve my heart out for that so sweet young girl. I give my blood for her, and though I am old and worn, I give my time, my skill, my sleep. I let my other sufferers want, that she may have all. And yet I can laugh at her very grave, laugh when the clay from the spade of the sexton drop from her coffin and say, thud, thud, to my heart, till it send back the blood from my cheek. My heart bleed for that poor boy, that dear boy. So of the age of mine own boy had I been so blessed that he live, and with his hair and eyes the same. There, you know now why I love him so, and yet when he say things that touch my husband heart to the quick, and make my father heart yearn to him as to no other man, not even you, friend John, 
for we are more level in experiences than father and son. Yet even at such a moment, King Laugh, he come to me and shout and bellow in my ear, Here I am, here I am, till the blood come dance back and bring some of the sunshine that he carry with him to my cheek. Oh, friend John, it is a strange world, a sad world, a world of miseries and woes and troubles, and yet when King Laugh come, he make them all dance to the tune he play, bleeding hearts and dry bones of the churchyard, and tears that burn as they fall, all dance together to the music that he make with that smileless mouth of him. And believe me, friend John, that he is good to come, and kind. Ah, we men and women are like ropes, drawn tight with strain, that pull us different ways. Then tears come, and like the rain on the ropes, they brace us up, until perhaps the strain become too great, and we break. But King Laugh, he come like the sunshine, and he ease off the strain again, and we bear to go on with our labor, what it may be. I did not like to wound him by pretending not to see his idea, but as I did not yet understand the cause of his laughter, I asked him. As he answered me, his face grew stern, and he said, in quite a different tone, Oh, it was the grim irony of it all, this so lovely lady garlanded with flowers that looked so fair as life, till one by one we wondered if she were truly dead. She laid in that so fine marble house, in that lonely churchyard, where rest so many of her kin, laid there with the mother who loved her, and whom she loved, and that sacred bell going toll, 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 so sad and slow, and those holy men with the white garments of the angel, pretending to read books, and yet all the time their eyes never on the page, and all of us with the bowed head. And all for what? She is dead, so? Is it not? Well, for the life of me, Professor, I said, I can't see anything to laugh at in all that. Why, your expression makes it a harder puzzle than before. But even if the burial service was comic, what about poor Art and his trouble? Why, his heart was simply breaking. Just so. Said he not that the transfusion of his blood to her veins had made her truly his bride? Yes, and it was a sweet and comforting idea for him. Quite so. But there was a difficulty, friend John. If so that, then what about the others? Ho, oh, ho, oh, then this so sweet maid is a polyandrist, and me, with my poor wife dead to me, but alive by church's law, though no wits all gone, even I, who am faithful husband to this now no wife, am bigamist. I don't see where the joke comes in there either, I said and I did not feel particularly pleased with him for saying such things. He laid his hand on my arm and said, Friend John, forgive me if I pain. I showed not my feelings to others when it would wound, but only to you, my old friend, whom I can trust. If you could have looked into my heart, then 
when I want to laugh. If you could have done so when the laugh arrived, if you could do so now, when King Laugh have peck up his crown, and all that is to him, for he go far, far away from me, and for a long, long time. Maybe you would perhaps pity me the most of all. I was touched by the tenderness of his tone, and asked why. Because I know. And now we are all scattered, and for many a long day loneliness will sit over our roofs with brooding wings. Lucy lies in the tomb of her kin, a lordly death-house in a lonely churchyard, away from teeming London, where the air is fresh, and the sun rises over Hampstead Hill, and where wild flowers grow of their own accord. So, I can finish this diary, and God only knows if I shall ever begin another. If I do, or, if I even open this again, it will be to deal with different people and different themes, for here at the end, where the romance of my life is told, here I go back to take up the thread of my life work. I say sadly, and without hope, Finis. The Westminster Gazette 25 September. A Hampstead Mystery. The neighborhood of Hampstead is just at present exercised with a series of events which seem to run on lines parallel to those of what was known to the writers of headlines as the Kensington Horror, or the Stabbing Woman, or the Woman in Black. During the past two or three days several cases have occurred of young children straying from home or neglecting to return from their playing on the heath. In all these cases the children were too young to give any properly intelligible account of themselves, but the consensus of their excuses is that they had been with a bluefer lady. It has always been late in the evening when they have been missed, and on two occasions the children have not been found until early in the following morning. It is generally supposed in the neighborhood that, as the first child missing gave as his reason for being away, that a bluefer lady had asked him to come for a walk. The others had picked up on the phrase and used it as occasion served. This is the more natural as the favorite game of the little ones at present is luring each other away by wiles. A correspondent writes us that to see some of the tiny tots pretending to be the bluefer lady is supremely funny. Some of our characterists might, he says, take a lesson in the irony of grotesque, by comparing the reality and the picture. It is only in accordance with general principles of human nature that the bluefer lady should be the popular role at these alfresco performances. Our correspondent naively says that even Ellen Terry could not be so winningly attractive as some of these grubby-faced little children pretend, or even imagine themselves, to be. There is, however, possibly a serious side to the question, for some of the children, indeed all who have been missed at night, have been slightly torn or wounded in the throat. The wound seems such as might be made by a rat or a small dog, and although of not much importance individually, would tend to show that whatever animal inflicts them has a system or method of its own. The police of the division have been instructed to keep a sharp lookout for straying children, especially when very young, in and around Hampstead Heath, and for any stray dog which may be about. The Westminster Gazette, 25 September, Extra Special, The Hampstead Horror, Another Child Injured, The Bluefer Lady. We have just received intelligence that another child, missed last night, was only discovered late in the morning under a furze bush at the Shooter's Hill side of Hampstead Heath which is perhaps less frequented than the other parts. It has the same tiny wound in the throat as has been noticed in other cases. It was terribly weak and looked quite emaciated. It, too, when partially restored, 
had the common story to tell of being lured away by the bluefer lady. End of chapter 13 Dracula by Bram Stoker Chapter 14 Mina Harker's Journal 23rd September Jonathan is better after a bad night. I am so glad that he has plenty of work to do, for that keeps his mind off the terrible things. And, oh, I am rejoiced that he is not now weighed down with the responsibility of his new position. I knew he would be true to himself, and now how proud I am to see my Jonathan rising to the height of his advancement, and keeping pace in all ways with the duties that come upon him. He will be away all day till late, for he said he could not lunch at home. My household work is done, so I shall take his foreign journal, and lock myself up in my room and read it. 24 September I hadn't the heart to write last night. That terrible record of Jonathan's upset me so. Poor dear! How he must have suffered, whether it be true or only imagination! I wonder if there is any truth in it at all. Did he get his brain fever, and then write all those terrible things? Or had he some cause for it all? I suppose I shall never know, for I dare not open the subject to him. And yet that man we saw yesterday! He seemed quite certain of him, poor fellow. I suppose it was the funeral upset him, and sent his mind back on some train of thought. He believes it all himself. I remember how on our wedding day he said, "'Unless some solemn duty come upon me to go back to the bitter hours, asleep or awake, mad or sane. There seems to be through it all some thread of continuity. That fearful Count was coming to London. If it should be, and he came to London, with its teeming millions, there may be a solemn duty, and if it come we must not shrink from it. I shall be prepared. I shall get my typewriter this very hour and begin transcribing. Then we shall be ready for other eyes if required. And if it be wanted, then perhaps, if I am ready, poor Jonathan may not be upset, for I can speak for him, and never let him be troubled or worried with it all. If ever Jonathan quite gets over the nervousness, he may want to tell me of it all, and I can ask him questions and find out things, and see how I may comfort him. Letter Van Helsing to Mrs. Harker 24 September Confidence Dear Madam, I pray you to pardon my writing, in that I am so far friend as that I sent to you sad news of Miss Lucy Westernra's death. By the kindness of Lord Galdeming, I am empowered to read her letters and papers, for I am deeply concerned about certain matters vitally important. In them I find some letters from you, which show how great friends you were and how you love her. O oh, Madame Mina, by that love I implore you, help me. It is for others' good that I ask, to redress great wrong, and to lift much and terrible troubles that may be more great than you can know. May it be that I see you? You can trust me. I am friend of Dr. John Seward, and of Lord Galdeming, that was Arthur of Miss Lucy. I must keep it private for the present from all. I should come to Exeter to see you at once if you tell me I am privileged to come, and where and when. I implore your pardon, madam. I have read your letters to poor Lucy, and know how good you are and how your husband suffer. So I pray you, if it be, enlighten him not, lest it may harm. Again, your pardon, and forgive me. Van Helsing Telegram, Mrs. Harker to Van Helsing 25th September Come to-day by quarter-past ten train if you can catch it. Can see you any time you call. Wilhelmina Harker Mina Harker's Journal 25th September I cannot help feeling terribly excited as the time draws near for the visit of Dr. Van Helsing, for somehow I expect that it will throw some light upon Jonathan's sad experience, and as he attended poor dear Lucy in her last illness, he can tell me all about her. That is the reason of his coming. It is concerning Lucy and her sleep-walking, and not about Jonathan. Then I shall never know the real truth now. How silly I am! That awful journal gets hold of my imagination and tinges everything with something of its own colour. Of course it is about Lucy. That habit came back to the poor dear, and that awful night on the cliff must have made her ill. I had almost forgotten in my own affairs how ill she was afterwards. 
She must have told him of her sleep-walking adventure on the cliff, and that I knew all about it, and now he wants me to tell him what I know, so that he may understand. I hope I did right in not saying anything of it to Mrs. Westenra. I should never forgive myself if any act of mine, were it even a negative one, brought harm on poor dear Lucy. I hope, too, Dr. Van Helsing will not blame me. I have had so much trouble and anxiety of late that I feel I cannot bear more just at present. I suppose a cry does us all good at times, clears the air as other rain does. Perhaps it was reading the journal yesterday that upset me. And then Jonathan went away this morning to stay away from me a whole day and night, the first time we have been parted since our marriage. I do hope the dear fellow will take care of himself, and that nothing will occur to upset him. It is two o'clock, and the doctor will be here soon now. I shall say nothing of Jonathan's journal unless he asks me. I am so glad I have typewritten out my own journal, so that in case he asks about Lucy I can hand it to him. It will save much questioning. Later. He has come and gone. Oh, what a strange meeting! And how it all makes my head whirl round! I feel like one in a dream. Can it be all possible, or even a part of it? If I had not read Jonathan's journal first, I should never have accepted even such a possibility. Ah, oh, poor, poor, dear Jonathan! How he must have suffered! Please the good God all this may not upset him again. I shall try to save him from it. But it may be even a consolation and a help to him, terrible though it be and awful in its consequences, to know for certain that his eyes and ears and brain did not deceive him, and that it is all true. It may be that it is the doubt which haunts him, that when the doubt is removed, no matter which, waking or dreaming may prove the truth, he will be more satisfied and better able to bear the shock. Dr. Van Helsing must be a good man as well as a clever one, if he is Arthur's friend and Dr. Seward's and if they brought him all the way from Holland to look after Lucy. I feel from having seen him that he is good and kind, and of a noble nature. When he comes to-morrow I shall ask him about Jonathan. And then, please God, all this sorrow and anxiety may lead to a good end. I used to think I would like to practice interviewing. Jonathan's friend on the Exeter News told him that memory is everything in such work, that you must be able to put down exactly almost every word spoken, even if you had to refine some of it afterwards. Here was a rare interview. I shall try to record it verbatim. It was half-past two o'clock when the knock came. I took my courage a deux main and waited. In a few minutes Mary opened the door, and announced Dr. Van Helsing. I rose and bowed, and he came towards me, a man of medium weight, strongly built, with his shoulders set back over a broad, deep chest, and a neck well balanced on the trunk as the head is on the neck. The poise of the head strikes me at once as indicative of thought and power. The head is noble, well-sized, broad, and large behind the ears. The face, clean-shaven, shows a hard square chin, a large, resolute, mobile mouth, a good-sized nose, rather straight, but with quick, sensitive nostrils, that seem to broaden as the big, bushy brows come down and the mouth tightens. The forehead is broad and fine, rising at first almost straight and then sloping back above two bumps or ridges wide apart, such a forehead that the reddish hair cannot possibly tumble over it, but falls naturally back and to the sides. Big, dark blue eyes are set widely apart, and are quick and tender or stern with the man's moods. He said to me, "'Mrs. Harker, is it not?' I bowed assent. "'That was Miss Mina Murray?' Again I assented. It is Miss Mina Murray that I came to see that was a friend of that poor dear child Lucy Westenra. Madame Mina, it is on account of the dead that I come." "'Sir,' said I, "'you could have no better claim on me than that you were a friend and helper of Lucy Westenra." And I held out my hand. He took it, and said tenderly, "'Oh, Madame Mina, I know that the friend of that poor little girl must be good, but I had yet to learn.' He finished his speech with a courtly bow. I asked him what it was that he wanted to see me about, so he at once began. "'I have read your letters to Miss Lucy. Forgive me, but I had to begin to inquire somewhere, and there was none to ask. I know that you were with her at Whitby. She sometimes kept a diary. You need not look surprised, Madame Mina. It was begun after you had left, and was an imitation of you, and in that diary she traces by inference certain things to a sleep-walking in which she puts down that you saved her. In great perplexity, then, I come to you, and ask you, out of your so much kindness, to tell me all of it that you can remember." 
I can tell you I think, Dr. Van Helsing, all about it. Ah, then you have good memory for facts, for details. It is not always so with young ladies. No, doctor, but I wrote it all down at the time. I can show it to you if you like. Oh, Madam Mina, I will be grateful. You will do me much favour. I could not resist the temptation of mystifying him a bit. I suppose it is some taste of the original apple that remains still in our mouths. So I handed him the shorthand diary. He took it with a grateful bow, and said, "'May I read it?' "'If you wish,' I answered as demurely as I could. He opened it, and for an instant his face fell. Then he stood up and bowed. "'Oh, you so clever woman,' he said. "'I knew long that Mr. Jonathan was a man of much thankfulness. But see, his wife have all the good things. And will you not so much honour me, and so help me as to read it for me? Alas, I know not the shorthand." By this time my little joke was over, and I was almost ashamed. So I took the typewritten copy from my work-basket, and handed it to him. "'Forgive me,' I said. I could not help it. But I had been thinking that it was of dear Lucy that you wished to ask, and so that you might not have time to wait, not on my account, but because I know your time must be precious, I have written it out on the typewriter for you." He took it, and his eyes glistened. "'You are so good,' he said. "'And may I read it now? I may want to ask you some things when I have read.' "'By all means,' I said. "'Read it over whilst I order lunch, and then you can ask me questions whilst we eat.' He bowed and settled himself in a chair with his back to the light, and became so absorbed in the papers, whilst I went to see after lunch chiefly in order that he might not be disturbed. When I came back, I found him walking hurriedly up and down the room, his face all ablaze with excitement. He rushed up to me and took me by both hands. "'Oh, Madam Mina,' he said, "'how can I say what I owe to you? This paper is as sunshine. It opens the gate to me. I am dazed, I am dazzled with so much light. And yet clouds roll in behind the light every time. But that you do not, you cannot comprehend. Oh, but I am grateful to you, you so clever woman! Madam! he said this very solemnly. If ever Abraham van Helsing can do anything for you or yours, I trust you will let me know. It will be pleasure and delight if I may serve you as a friend, as a friend. But all I have ever learned, all I can ever do, shall be for you and those you love. There are darknesses in life, and there are lights. You are one of the lights. You will live a happy life and a good life, and your husband will be blessed in you." But, Doctor, you praise me too much, and you do not know me. Not know you? I, who am old, and who have studied all my life, men and women, I, who have made my specialty the brain and all that belongs to him, and all that follow from him, and I have read your diary that you have so goodly written for me, and which breathes out truth in every line, I, who have read your so sweet letter to poor Lucy of your marriage and your trust, not know you? Oh, Madam Mina, good women tell all their lives, and by day and by hour and by minute such things that angels can read, and we men who wish to know have in us something of angels' eyes. Your husband is noble nature, and you are noble too, for you trust, and trust cannot be where there is mean nature. And your husband, tell me of him. Is he quite well? Is all that fever gone, and is he strong and hearty?" I saw here an opening to ask him about Jonathan. So I said, He was almost recovered, but he has been greatly upset by Mr. Hawkins' death. He interrupted, Oh, yes, I know, I know, I have read your last two letters. I went on, I suppose this upset him. For when we were in town on Thursday last, he had a sort of shock." "'A shock? And after brain fever so soon? That is not good. What kind of shock was it?' He thought he saw someone who recalled something terrible, something which led to his brain fever. And here the whole thing seemed to overwhelm me in a rush, the pity for Jonathan, the horror which he experienced, the whole fearful mystery of his diary, and the fear that has been brooding over me all since, all came in a tumult. I suppose I was hysterical, for I threw myself on my knees and held up my hands to him, and implored him to make my husband well again. He took my hands and raised me up and made me sit on the sofa, and sat by me. He held my hand in his, and said to me with, oh, such infinite sweetness, My life is a barren and lonely one, and so full of work that I have not had much time for friendships. But since I have been summoned to hear by my friend John Seward, I have known so many good people, and seen such nobility, that I feel more than ever, and it has grown with my advancing years, the loneliness of my life. Believe me, then, that I come here full of respect for you, and you have given me hope, hope, not in what I am seeking of, but that there are good women still left to make life happy, good women, 
whose lives and whose truths may make good lesson for the children that are to be. I am glad, glad that I may be here of some use to you. For if your husband suffer, he suffer within the range of my study and experience. I promise you that I will gladly do all for him that I can, all to make his life strong and manly, and your life a happy one. Now you must eat. You are overwrought and perhaps over-anxious. Husband Jonathan would not like to see you so pale, and what he like not where he love is not to his good. Therefore for his sake you must eat and smile. You have told me about Lucy, and so now you shall not speak of it, lest it distress. I shall stay in Exeter to-night, for I want to think much over what you have told me, and when I have thought I will ask you questions, if I may. And then, too, you will tell me of husband Jonathan's trouble so far as you can, but not yet. You must eat now. Afterwards you shall tell me all." After lunch, when we went back to the drawing-room, he said to me, "'And now tell me all about him.' When it came to speaking to this great learned man, I began to fear that he would think me a weak fool, and Jonathan a madman. That journal is all so strange, and I hesitated to go on. But he was so sweet and kind, and he had promised to help, and I trusted him. So I said, "'Dr. Van Helsing, what I have to tell you is so queer that you must not laugh at me or at my husband. I have been since yesterday in a sort of fever of doubt. You must be kind to me, and not think me foolish that I have even half believed some very strange things." He reassured me by his manner as well as his words when he said, "'Oh, my dear, if you only know how strange is the matter regarding which I am here, it is you who would laugh. I have learned not to think little of any one's belief, no matter how strange it may be. I have tried to keep an open mind, and it is not the ordinary things of life that could close it, but the strange things, the extraordinary things, the things that make one doubt if they be mad or sane." Oh, thank you! Thank you a thousand times! You have taken a weight off my mind. If you will let me, I shall give you a paper to read. It is long, but I have typewritten it out. It will tell you my trouble and Jonathan's. It is the copy of his journal when abroad, and all that happened. I dare not say anything of it. You will read for yourself and judge. And then when I see you, perhaps, you will be very kind and tell me what you think." "'I promise,' he said as I gave him the papers. I shall in the morning, as soon as I can, come to see you and your husband, if I may. Jonathan will be here at half-past eleven, and you must come to lunch with us and see him then. You could catch the quick 3.34 train, which will leave you at Paddington before eight. He was surprised at my knowledge of the trains off-hand, but he does not know that I have made up all the trains to and from Exeter, so that I may help Jonathan in case he is in a hurry. So he took the papers with him and went away, and I sit here thinking, thinking, I don't know what. Letter by hand, Van Helsing to Mrs. Harker. 25 September, 6 o'clock. Dear Madam Mina, I have read your husband's so wonderful diary. You may sleep without doubt. Strange and terrible as it is, it is true. I will pledge my life on it. It may be worse for others, but for him and you there is no dread. He is a noble fellow, and let me tell you from experience of men that one who would do as he did in going down that wall and into that room, I, and going a second time, is not one to be injured in permanence by shock. His brain and his heart are all right. This I swear, before I have even seen him. So be at rest. I shall have much to ask him of other things. I am blessed that to-day I come to see you, for I have learned all at once so much that again I am dazzled, dazzled more than ever, and I must think. Yours the most faithful, Abraham Van Helsink. Letter, Mrs. Harker to Van Helsing. 25th September, 6.30 p.m. My dear Dr. Van Helsing, a thousand thanks for your kind letter, which has taken a great weight off my mind. And yet if it be true, what terrible things there are in the world, and what an awful thing if that man, that monster, be really in London! Oh, I fear to think! I have this moment, whilst writing, had a wire from Jonathan, saying that he leaves by the 6.25 to-night from Launceston, and will be here at 10.18, so that I shall have no fear to-night. Will you, therefore, instead of lunching with us, please come to breakfast at eight o'clock, if this be not too early for you? You can get away if you are in a hurry by the 10.30 train, which will bring you to Paddington by 2.35. Do not answer this, as I shall take it that, if I do not hear, you will come to breakfast. Believe me, your faithful and grateful friend, 
Mina Harker. Jonathan Harker's Journal. Twenty six September. I thought never to write in this diary again, but the time has come. When I got home last night, Mina had supper ready, and when we had supped, she told me of Van Helsing's visit, and of her having given him the two diaries copied out, and of how anxious she has been about me. She showed me in the doctor's letter that all I wrote down was true. It seems to have made a new man of me. It was the doubt as to the reality of the whole thing that knocked me over. I felt impotent and in the dark and distrustful, but now that I know I am not afraid even of the Count. He has succeeded, after all, then, in his design in getting to London, and it was he I saw. He has got younger, and how? Van Helsing is the man to unmask him and hunt him out, if he is anything like what Mina says. We sat late and talked it over. Mina's dressing, and I shall call at the hotel in a few minutes and bring him over. He was, I think, surprised to see me. When I came into the room where he was and introduced myself, he took me by the shoulder and turned my face round to the light and said, after a sharp scrutiny, But Madame Mina told me you were ill, that you had had a shock. It was so funny to hear my wife called Madame Mina by this kindly, strong-faced old man. I smiled and said, I was ill, I have had a shock, but you have cured me already. And how? By your letter to Mina last night. I was in doubt, and then everything took a hue of unreality, and I did not know what to trust, even the evidence of my own senses. Not knowing what to trust, I did not know what to do, and so had only to keep on working in what had hitherto been the groove of my life. The groove ceased to avail me, and I mistrusted myself. Doctor, you don't know what it is like to doubt everything, even yourself. No, you don't. You couldn't with eyebrows like yours. He seemed pleased and laughed as he said, So, you are a physiognomist. I learn more here with each hour. I am with so much pleasure coming to your breakfast. And, oh, sir, you will pardon praise from an old man, but you are blessed in your wife. I would listen to him go on praising Mina for a day, so I simply nodded and stood silent. She is one of God's women, fashioned by his own hand to show us men and other women that there is a heaven where we can enter, and that its light can be here on earth. So true, so sweet, so noble, so little an egoist, and that, let me tell you, is much in this age so sceptical and selfish. And you, sir, I have read all the letters to poor Miss Mina, and some of them speak of you, so I know you since some days, from the knowing of others. But I have seen your true self since last night. You will give me your hand, will you not? And let us be friends for all our lives. We shook hands, and he was so earnest and so kind that it made me quite choky. And now, he said, may I ask you for some more help? I have a great task to do, and at the beginning it is to know— you can help me here. Can you tell me what went before your going to Transylvania? Later on I may ask more help, and of a different kind, but at first this will do. Look here, sir, I said. Does what you have to do concern the Count? It does, he said solemnly. Then I am with you, heart and soul. As you go by the 10.30 train, you will not have time to read them, but I shall get the bundle of papers. You can take them with you and read them in the train. After breakfast I saw him to the station. When we were parting he said, Perhaps you will come to town if I send for you, and take Madame Mina too. We shall both come when you will, I said. I had got him the morning papers and the London papers of the previous night, and while we were talking at the carriage window, waiting for the train to start, he was turning them over. His eyes suddenly seemed to catch something in one of them, the Westminster Gazette. I knew it by the colour, and he grew quite white. He read something intently, groaning to himself. Mein Gott, mein Gott, so soon, so soon. I do not think he remembered me at the moment. Just then the whistle blew, and the train moved off. This recalled him to himself, and he leaned out of the window and waved his hand, calling out, 
love to madam mina i shall write so soon as ever i can dr seward's diary twenty sixth september truly there is no such thing as finality not a week since i said finis and yet here i am starting fresh again or rather going on with the record until this afternoon i had no cause to think of what is done renfield had become to all intents as sane as he ever was he was already well ahead with his fly business and he had just started in the spider line also so he had not been of any trouble to me i had a letter from arthur written on sunday and from it i gather that he is bearing up wonderfully well quincy morris is with him and that is much of a help for he himself is a bubbling well of good spirits quincy wrote me a line too and from him i hear that arthur is beginning to recover something of his old buoyancy so as to them all my mind is at rest as for myself i was settling down to my work with enthusiasm which i used to have for it so that i might fairly have said that the wound which poor lucy left on me was becoming cicatrized everything is however now reopened and what is to be the end god only knows i have an idea that van helsing thinks he knows too but he will only let out enough at a time to wet curiosity he went to exeter yesterday and stayed there all night to-day he came back and almost bounded into the room at about half past five o'clock and thrust last night's westminster gazette into my hand what do you think of that he asked as he stood back and folded his arms i looked over the paper for i really did not know what he meant but he took it from me and pointed out a paragraph about children being decoyed away at hampstead it did not convey much to me until i reached a passage where it described small puncture wounds on their throats an idea struck me and i looked up well he said it is like poor lucy's and what do you make of it simply that there is some cause in common whatever it was that injured her has injured them i did not quite understand his answer that is true indirectly but not directly how do you mean professor i asked i was a little inclined to take his seriousness lightly for after all four days of rest and freedom from burning harrowing anxiety does help to restore one's spirits but when i saw his face it sobered me never even in the midst of our despair about poor lucy had he looked more stern tell me i said i can hazard no opinion i do not know what to think and i have no data on which to found a conjecture do you mean to tell me friend john that you have no suspicion as to what poor lucy died of not after all the hints given not only by events but by me of nervous prostration following a great loss or waste of blood and how was the blood lost or wasted i shook my head he stepped over and sat down beside me and went on you are a clever man friend john you reason well and your wit is bold but you are too prejudiced you do not let your eyes see nor your ears hear and that which is outside your daily life is not of account to you do you not think that there are things which you cannot understand and yet which are that some people see things that others cannot but there are some things old and new which must not be contemplated by men's eyes because they know or think they know some things which other men have told them ah 
it is the fault of our science that it wants to explain all and if it explain not then it says there is nothing to explain but yet we see around us every day the growth of new beliefs which think themselves new and which are yet but the old would pretend to be young like the fine ladies at the opera i suppose now you do not believe in corporeal transference no nor in materialization no nor in astral bodies no nor in the reading of thought no nor in hypnotism yes i said charcot has proved that pretty well he smiled as he went on then you are satisfied as to it yes and of course then you understand how it act and can follow the mind of the great charcot alas that he is no more into the very soul of the patient that he influence no then friend john am i to take it that you simply accept fact and are satisfied to let from premise to conclusion be a blank no then tell me for i am a student of the brain how you accept hypnotism and reject the thought reading let me tell you my friend that there are things done to-day in electrical science which would have been deemed unholy by the very man who discovered electricity who would themselves not so long before been burned as wizards there are always mysteries in life why was it that methuselah lived nine hundred years and old parr one hundred and sixty-nine and yet the poor lucy with four men's blood in her poor veins could not live even one day for had she lived one more day we could save her do you know all the mystery of life and death do you know the altogether of comparative anatomy and can say wherefore the qualities of brutes are in some men and not in others can you tell me why when other spiders die small and soon that one great spider lived for centuries in the tower of the old spanish church and grew and grew till on descending he could drink the oil of all the church lamps can you tell me why in the pampas ay and elsewhere there are bats that come out at night and open the veins of cattle and horses and suck dry their veins how in some islands of the western seas there are bats which hang on the trees all day and those who have seen them describe as like giant nuts or pods and that when the sailors sleep on the deck because that it is hot flip down on them and then and then in the morning are found dead men white as even miss lucy was good god professor i said starting up do you mean to tell me that lucy was bitten by such a bat and that such a thing is here in london in the nineteenth century he waved his hand for silence and then went on can you tell me why the tortoise lives more long than generations of men why the elephant goes on and on till he have seas dynasties and why the parrot never die only of bite of cat of dog or other complaint can you tell me why men believe in all ages and places that there are men and women who cannot die we all know because science has vouched for the fact that there have been toads shut up in rocks for thousands of years shut in one so small hole that only hold him since the youth of the world can you tell me how the indian faker can make himself to die and have been buried and his grave sealed and corn sowed on it and the corn reaped and be cut and sown and reaped and cut again 
and then men come and take away the unbroken seal, and that there lie the Indian faker, not dead, but that rise up and walk amongst them, as before. Here I interrupted him. I was getting bewildered. He so crowded on my mind his list of nature's eccentricities and possible impossibilities that my imagination was getting fired. I had a dim idea that he was teaching me some lesson, as long ago he used to in his study at Amsterdam, but he used them to tell me the thing, so that I could have the object of thought in mind all the time. But now I was without his help, yet I wanted to follow him. So I said, Professor, let me be your pet student again. Tell me the thesis, so that I may apply your knowledge as you go on. At present I am going, in my mind, from point to point, as a madman, and not a sane one, follows an idea. I feel like a novice lumbering through a bog in a mist, jumping from one tussock to another in the mere blind effort to move on, without knowing where I am going. That is a good image, he said. Well, I shall tell you. My thesis is this. I want you to believe. To believe what? To believe in things that you cannot. Let me illustrate. I heard once of an American who so defined faith, that faculty which enables us to believe things which we know to be untrue. For one, I follow that man. He meant that we shall have an open mind, and not let a little bit of truth check the rush of the big truth, like a small rock does a railway truck. We shall get the small truth first. Good. We keep him, and we value him, but all the same we must not let him think himself all the truth in the universe." then you want me not to let some previous conviction inure the receptivity of my mind with regard to some strange matter. Do I read your lesson and write? Ah, you are my favorite pupil still. It is worth to teach you. Now that you are willing to understand, you have taken the first step to understand. You think, then, that those so small holes in the children's throats were made by the same that made the holes in Miss Lucy? I suppose so. He stood up and said solemnly, Then you are wrong. Oh, would it were so. But alas, no, it is worse, far worse. In God's name, Professor Van Helsing, what do you mean? I cried. He threw himself with a despairing gesture into a chair, and placed his elbows on the table, covering his face with his hands as he spoke. They were made by Miss Lucy. End of chapter 14 Dracula by Bram Stoker Chapter 15 Dr. Seward's Diary Continued For a while, sheer anger mastered me. It was as if he had, during her life, struck Lucy on the face. I smote the table hard, and rose up, as I said to him, Dr. Van Helsing, are you mad? He raised his head and looked at me, and somehow the tenderness of his face calmed me at once. Would I were, he said. Madness were easy to bear compared with truth like this. Oh, my friend, why, think you, did I go so far round? Why take so long to tell so simple a thing? Was it because I hate you, and have hated you all my life? Was it because I wished to give you pain? Was it that I wanted, now, so late, revenge for that time, when you saved my life, and from a fearful death? Ah, 
No. Forgive me, said I. He went on, my friend. It was because I wished to be gentle in the breaking to you, for I know you have loved that so sweet lady. But even yet I do not expect you to believe. It is so hard to accept at once any abstract truth, that we may doubt such to be possible when we have always believed the no of it. It is more hard still to accept so sad a concrete truth, and of such a one as Miss Lucy. To-night I go to prove it. Dare you come with me? This staggered me. A man does not like to prove such a truth. Byron accepted from the category jealousy and proved the very truth he most abhorred. He saw my hesitation, and spoke. The logic is simple. No madman's logic this time, jumping from tussock to tussock in a misty bog. If it not be true, then proof will be relief. At worst, it will not harm. If it be true, ah! There is the dread. Yet every dread should help my cause, for in it is some need of belief. Come, I tell you what I propose. First, that we go off now and see that child in the hospital. Dr. Vincent of the North Hospital, where the papers say the child is, is a friend of mine, and I think of yours since you were in class at Amsterdam. He will let two scientists see his case, if he will not let two friends. We shall tell him nothing, but only that we wish to learn. And then, and then, he took a key from his pocket and held it up. And then we spend the night, you and I, in the churchyard where Lucy lies, this is the key that lock the tomb. I had it from the coffin man to give to Arthur. My heart sank within me, for I felt that there was some fearful ordeal before us. I could do nothing, however, so I plucked up what heart I could, and said that we had better hasten, as the afternoon was passing. We found the child awake. It had had a sleep, and taken some food, and, altogether, was going on well. Dr. Vincent took the bandage from its throat, and showed us the punctures. There was no mistaking the similarity to those which had been on Lucy's throat. They were smaller, and the edges looked fresher, that was all. We asked Vincent to what he attributed them, and he replied that it must have been a bite of some animal, perhaps a rat, but for his own part he was inclined to think it was one of the bats which are so numerous on the northern heights of London. Out of so many harmless ones, he said, there may be some wild specimen from the south of a more malignant species. Some sailor may have brought one home, and it managed to escape, or even from the zoological gardens, a young one may have got loose, or one be bred there from a vampire. These things do occur, you know. Only ten days ago a wolf got out, and was, I believe, traced up in this direction. For a week after, the children were playing nothing but Red Riding Hood on the heath, and in every alley in the place, until this blofer lady scare came along. Since then it has been quite a gala time with them. Even this poor little mite, when he woke up today, asked the nurse if he might go away. When she asked him why he wanted to go, he said he wanted to play with the blofer lady. 
I hope, said Van Helsing, that when you are sending the child home, you will caution its parents to keep strict watch over it. These fancies to stray are most dangerous, and if the child were to remain out another night, it would probably be fatal. But in any case, I suppose you will not let it away for some days. Oh, certainly not. Not for a week at least. Longer, if the wound is not healed. Our visit to the hospital took more time than we had reckoned on, and the sun had dipped before we came out. When Van Helsing saw how dark it was, he said, There is not hurry. It is more late than I thought. Come, let us seek somewhere that we may eat, and then we shall go on our way. We dined at Jack Straw's Castle along with a little crowd of bicyclists and others who were genially noisy. About ten o'clock we started from the inn. It was then very dark, and the scattered lamps made the darkness greater when we were once outside their individual radius. The professor had evidently noted the road we were to go, for he went on unhesitatingly, but, as for me, I was in quite a mix-up as to locality. As we went further, we met fewer and fewer people, till at last we were somewhat surprised when we met even the patrol of horse-police going their usual suburban round. At last we reached the wall of the churchyard, which we climbed over. With some little difficulty, for it was very dark, and the whole place seemed so strange to us. We found the Westenra tomb. The professor took the key, opened the creaky door, and standing back politely, but quite unconsciously, motioned me to precede him. There was a delicious irony in the offer, in the courtliness of giving preference on such a ghastly occasion. My companion followed me quickly, and cautiously drew the door to, after carefully ascertaining that the lock was a falling, and not a spring one. In the latter case, we should have been in a bad plight. Then he fumbled in his bag, and taking out a matchbox, and a piece of candle, proceeded to make a light. The tomb in the daytime, and when wreathed with fresh flowers, had looked grim and gruesome enough. But now, some days afterwards, when the flowers hung lank and dead, their whites turning to rust and their greens to browns, when the spider and the beetle had resumed their accustomed dominance, when the time-discolored stone and dust-encrusted mortar and rusty dank iron, and tarnished brass, and clouded silver plating, gave back the feeble glimmer of a candle. The effect was more miserable and sordid than could have been imagined. It conveyed, irresistibly, the idea that life, animal life, was not the only thing which could pass away. Van Helsing went about his work systematically, holding his candle so that he could read the coffin plates, and so holding it that the sperm dropped in white patches, which congealed as they touched the metal. He made assurance of Lucy's coffin. Another search in his bag, and he took out a turnscrew. "'What are you going to do?' I asked. To open the coffin, you shall yet be convinced. Straightway he began taking out the screws, and finally lifted off the lid, showing the casing of lead beneath. The sight was almost too much for me. It seemed to be as much an affront to the dead as it would have been to have stripped off her clothing in her sleep. 
whilst living. I actually took hold of his hand to stop him. He only said, You shall see. And again, fumbling in his bag, took out a tiny fret saw. Striking the turnscrew through the lead with a swift downward stab, which made me wince, he made a small hole, which was, however, big enough to admit the point of the saw. I had expected a rush of gas from the weak old corpse. We doctors who have had to study our dangers have to become accustomed to such things, and I drew back towards the door. But the professor never stopped for a moment. He sawed down a couple of feet along one side of the lead coffin, and then across, and down the other side. Taking the edge of the loose flange, he bent it back towards the foot of the coffin, and holding up the candle into the aperture, motioned to me to look. I drew near and looked. The coffin was empty. It was certainly a surprise to me, and gave me a considerable shock, but Van Helsing was unmoved. He was now more sure than ever of his ground, and so emboldened to proceed in his task. "'Are you satisfied now, friend John?' he asked. I felt all the dogged argumentativeness of my nature awake within me, as I answered him. "'I am satisfied that Lucy's body is not in that coffin, but that only proves one thing.' "'What is that, friend John?' "'That it is not there.' "'That is good logic,' he said, so far as it goes. "'But how do you, how can you, account for it not being there?' "'Perhaps a body-snatcher,' I suggested. "'Some of the undertaker's people may have stolen it.' "'I felt that I was speaking foully.' and yet it was the only real cause which I could suggest. The professor sighed. Ah, well, he said, we must have more proof. Come with me. He put on the coffin lid again, gathered up all his things, and placed them in the bag, blew out the light, and placed the candle also in the bag. We opened the door and went out. Behind us he closed the door, and locked it. He handed me the key, saying, Will you keep it? You had better be assured. I laughed. It was not a cheerful laugh, I am bound to say, as I motioned him to keep it. <laughs> the key is nothing, I said. There are many duplicates, and anyhow... It is not difficult to pick a lock of this kind. He said nothing, but put the key in his pocket. Then he told me to watch at one side of the churchyard, whilst he would watch at the other. I took up my place behind a yew tree, and I saw his dark figure move until the intervening headstones and trees hid it from my sight. It was a lonely vigil. Just after I had taken my place, I heard a distant clock strike twelve, and in time came one, and two. I was chilled and unnerved and angry with the professor for taking me on such an errand, and with myself for coming. I was too cold and too sleepy to be keenly observant, and not sleepy enough to betray my trust, so altogether I had a dreary, miserable time. Suddenly, as I turned around, I thought I saw something like a white streak moving between the two dark yew-trees at the side of the churchyard, farthest from the tomb. At the same time, a dark mass moved from the professor's side of the ground, and 
hurriedly went towards it. Then I too moved, but I had to go round headstones and railed off tombs, and I stumbled over graves. The sky was overcast, and somewhere far off an early cock crew. A little ways off, beyond a line of scattered juniper trees, which marked the pathway to the church, a white, dim figure flitted in the direction of the tomb. The tomb itself was hidden by trees, and I could not see where the figure had disappeared. I heard the rustle of actual movement, where I had first seen the white figure, and, coming over, found the professor holding in his arms a tiny child. When he saw me, he held it out to me, and said, "'Are you satisfied now?' No, I said, in a way that I felt was aggressive. Do you not see the child? <laughs> yes, it is a child, but who brought it here? And is it wounded? We shall see, said the professor, and with one impulse we took our way out of the churchyard, he carrying the sleepy child. When we had got some little distance away, we went into a clump of trees, and struck a match, and looked at the child's throat. It was without a scratch or a scar of any kind. Was I right? I asked triumphantly. We were just in time, said the professor thankfully. We had now to decide what we were to do with the child, and so consulted about it. If we were to take it to a police station, we should have to give some account of our movements during the night. At least we should have had to make some statement as to how we had come to find the child. So finally we decided that we would take it to the heath, and when we heard a policeman coming, would leave it where he could not fail to find it. We would then seek our way home as quickly as we could. All fell out well. At the edge of Hampstead Heath we heard a policeman's heavy tramp, and laying the child on the pathway, we waited and watched until he saw it as he flashed his lantern to and fro. We heard his exclamation of astonishment, and then we went away silently. By good chance, we got a cab near the Spaniards, and drove to town. I cannot sleep, so I make this entry. Oh, but I must try to get a few hours sleep, as Van Helsing is to call for me at noon. He insists that I go with him on another expedition. 27 September. It was two o'clock before we found a suitable opportunity for our attempt. The funeral held at noon was all completed, and the last stragglers of the mourners had taken themselves lazily away, when, looking carefully from behind a clump of alder trees, we saw the sexton lock the gate after him. We knew that we were safe till morning, it did we desire it, but the professor told me that we should not want more than an hour at most. Again, I felt that horrid sense of the reality of things, in which any effort of imagination seemed out of place, and I realized distinctly the perils of the law which we were incurring in our unhallowed work. Besides, I felt it was all so useless, outrageous as it was to open a leaden coffin, to see if a woman dead nearly a week were really dead, it now seemed the height of folly to open the tomb again, when we knew, from the evidence of our own eyesight, that the coffin was empty. I shrugged, my shoulders. 
however, and rested silent, for Van Helsing had a way of going on his own road, no matter who remonstrated. He took the key, opened the vault, and again, courteously, motioned me to proceed. The place was not so gruesome as last night, but, oh, how un utterably mean-looking when the sunshine streamed in. Van Helsing walked over to Lucy's coffin, and I followed. He bent over, and again forced back the leaden flange, and a shock of surprise and dismay shot through me. There lay Lucy, seemingly, just as we had seen her, the night before her funeral. She was, if possible, more radiantly beautiful than ever, and I could not believe that she was dead. The lips were red, nay, redder than before, and on the cheeks was a delicate bloom. Is this a juggle? I said to him. Are you convinced? Now, said the professor in response, and as he spoke he put over his hand, and in a way that made me shudder, pulled back the dead lips and showed the white teeth. See, he went on, they are even sharper than before. With this and this, and he touched one of the canine teeth, and that below it, the little children can be bitten. Are you of belief now, friend John? Once more, argumentative hostility woke within me. I could not accept such an overwhelming idea as he suggested. So, with an attempt to argue, of which I was even at the moment ashamed, I said, She may have been placed here since last night. Indeed, and that is so. And by whom? I do not know. Someone has done it. And yet she has been dead one week. Most peoples in that time would... Not look so. I had no answer for this, so was silent. Van Helsing did not seem to notice my silence. At any rate, he showed neither chagrin nor triumph. He was looking intently at the face of the dead woman, raising the eyelids and looking at the eyes and once more opening the lips and examining the teeth. Then he turned to me and said, Here there is one thing which is different from all recorded. Here is some dual life that is not as the common. She was bitten by the vampire when she was in a trance, sleepwalking. Oh, you start! You do not know that, friend John, but you shall know it later. And in trance could he best come to take more blood. In trance she dies, and in trance she is undead too. So it is that she differ from all other. Usually when the undead sleep at home, as he spoke, he made a comprehensive sweep of his arm to designate what, to a vampire, was home. Their face show what they are. But this is so sweet that was when she was not undead she go back to the nothings of the common dead. There is no malign there, see? And so it make hard that I must kill her in her sleep. 
this turned my blood cold, and it began to dawn upon me that I was accepting Van Helsing's theories. But if she were really dead, what was there of terror in the idea of killing her? He looked at me, and evidently saw the change in my face, for he almost said joyously, Ah, you believe now. I answered, Do not press me too hard all at once. I am willing to accept. How will you do this bloody work? I shall cut off her head and fill her mouth with garlic, and I shall drive a stake through her body. It made me shudder to think of so mutilating the body of the woman whom I had loved, and yet the feeling was not so strong as I had expected. I was, in fact, beginning to shudder at the presence of this being, this undead, as Van Helsing called it, and to loathe it. Is it possible that love is all subjective, or all objective? I waited a considerable time for Van Helsing to begin, but he stood as if wrapped in thought. Presently he closed the catch of his bag with a snap, and said, I have been thinking, and have made up my mind as to what is best. If I did simply follow my inclining, I would do now, at this moment, what is to be done. But there are other things to follow, and things that are thousand times more difficult in that them we do not know. This is simple. She have yet no life taken, though that is of time, and to act now would be to take danger from her for ever. But then we may have to want Arthur. And how shall we tell him of this? If you who saw the wounds on Lucy's throat, and saw the wounds so similar on the child's at the hospitals, if you who saw the coffin empty last night and full to-day with a woman who have not changed only to be more rose and more beautiful in a whole week after she die if you know of this and know of the white figure last night that brought the child to the churchyard and yet of your own senses you did not believe how then can I expect Arthur, who know none of these things, to believe? He doubted me when I took him from her kiss when she was dying. I know he has forgiven me because, in some mistaken idea, I have done things that prevent him say good-bye as he ought, and he may think that, in some more mistaken idea, this woman was buried alive, and that, in most mistake of all, we have killed her. He will then argue back that it is we, mistaken ones, that have killed her by our ideas, and so he will be much unhappy, always, yet he never can be sure and that is the worst of all. And he will sometimes think that she he loved was buried alive, and that will paint his dreams with horrors of what she must have suffered. And again he will think that we may be right, and that his beloved was, after all, an undead. No, I told him once, 
and since then I learn much. Now, since I know it is all true, a hundred thousand times more do I know that he must pass through the bitter waters to reach the sweet. He, poor fellow, must have one hour that will make the very face of heaven grow black to him. Then we can act for good all round and send him peace. My mind is made up. Let us go. You return home for tonight to your asylum and see that all be well. As for me, I shall spend the night here in this churchyard in my own way. Tomorrow night you will come to me to the Barclay Hotel at ten of the clock. I shall send for Arthur to come too, and also that so fine young man of America that gave his blood. Later we shall all have work to do. I come with you so far as Piccadilly, and there dine, for I must be back here before the sun set. So we locked the tomb and came away, and got over the wall of the churchyard, which was not much of a task, and drove back to Piccadilly. Note left by Van Helsing in his portmanteau. Berkeley Hotel, directed to John Seward, M.D., not delivered. 27 September. Friend John, I write this in case anything should happen. I go alone to watch in that churchyard. It pleases me that the undead Miss Lucy shall not leave to-night, that so on the morrow night she may be more eager. Therefore I shall fix some things she like not, garlic and a crucifix, and so seal up the door of the tomb. She is young as undead, and will heed. Moreover, these are only to prevent her coming out. They may not prevail on her wanting to get in, for then the undead is desperate, and must find the line of least resistance, whatsoever it may be. I shall be at hand all the night, from sunset till after sunrise, and if there be aught that may be learned, I shall learn it. For Miss Lucy, or from her, I have no fear. But that other to whom is there that she is undead, he have not the power to seek her tomb and find shelter. He is cunning, as I know from Mr. Jonathan, and from the way that all along he hath fooled us when he played with us for Miss Lucy's life, and we lost. And in many ways the undead are strong. He have always the strength in his hand of twenty men. Even we four who gave our strength to Miss Lucy, it also is all to him. Besides, he can summon his wolf, and I know not what. So, if it be that he came thither on this night, he shall find me. But none other shall, until it be too late. But it may be that he will not attempt the place. There is no reason why he should. His hunting ground is more full of game than the churchyard where the undead woman sleeps and the one old man watch. Therefore I write this in case. Take the papers that are with this, the diaries of Harker and the rest, and read them. And then find this great undead, and cut off his head, and burn his heart, or drive a stake through it, so that the world may rest from him. If it be so, farewell. Van Helsing Dr. Seward's Diary, 28 September It is wonderful what a good night's sleep will do for one. Yesterday I was almost willing to accept Van Helsing's monstrous ideas, but now they seem to start out lurid before me as outrages on common sense. I have no doubt that he believes it all. I wonder if his mind can have become in any way unhinged. Surely there must be some rational explanation of all these mysterious things. Is it possible that the professor can have done it himself? He is so abnormally clever 
that if he went off his head, he would carry out his intent with regard to some fixed idea in a wonderful way. I am loath to think it, and indeed it would be almost as great a marvel as the other to find that Van Helsing was mad. But anyhow, I shall watch him carefully. I may get some light on the mystery. 29 September Last night, at a little before ten o'clock, Arthur and Quincy came into Van Helsing's room. He told us all what he wanted us to do, but especially addressing himself to Arthur, as if all our wills were centered in his. He began by saying that he hoped we would all come with him, too. For, he said, there is a grave duty to be done here. You were doubtless surprised at my letter. This query was directly addressed to Lord Galdami. <laughs> I was. It rather upset me for a bit. There has been so much trouble around my house of late that I could do without any more. I have been curious, too, as to what you mean. Quincy and I talked it over, but the more we talked, the more puzzled we got. Till now I can say, for myself, that I'm about up a tree as to any meaning about anything. Me, too, said Quincy Morris, laconically. Oh, said the professor, then you are nearer the beginning, both of you, than friend John here, who has to go a long way back before he can even get so far as to begin. It was evident that he recognized my return to my old doubting frame of mind without my saying a word. Then, turning to the other two, he said with intense gravity, I want your permission to do what I think good this night. It is, I know, much to ask, and when you know what it is I propose to do, you will know, and only then, how much. Therefore, may I ask, you promise me in the dark, so that afterwards, though you may be angry with me for a time, I must not disguise from myself the possibility that such may be. You shall not blame yourselves for anything. That's Frank, anyhow, broke in Quincy. I'll answer for the professor. I don't quite see his drift, but I swear he's honest, and that's good enough for me. I thank you, sir, said Van Helsing proudly. I have done myself the honor of counting you one trusting friend, and such endorsement is dear to me. He held out a hand, which Quincy took. Then Arthur spoke out. Dr. Van Helsing, I don't quite like to buy a pig and a poke, as they say in Scotland, and if it be anything in which my honor as a gentleman or my faith as a Christian is concerned, I cannot make such a promise. If you can assure me that what you intend does not violate either of these two, then I give my consent at once, though for the life of me I cannot understand what you are driving at. I accept your limitation, said Van Helsing, and all I ask of you is that if you feel it necessary to condemn any act of mine, you will first consider it well and be satisfied. 
that it does not violate your reservations. Agreed, said Arthur. That is only fair. And now that the poor parley are over, may I ask what it is we are to do? I want you to come with me, and to come in secret to the churchyard at Kingstead. Arthur's face fell, as he said, in an amazed sort of way. Where? Poor Lucy is buried? The professor bowed. Arthur went on. And when there? To enter the tomb. Arthur stood up. Professor, are you in earnest, or is it some monstrous joke? Pardon me. I see that you are in earnest. He sat down again, but I could see that he sat firmly and proudly, as one who is on his dignity. There was silence until he asked again, And when in the tomb? To open the coffin. This is too much, he said angrily, rising again. I am willing to be patient in all things that are reasonable, but in this, this desecration of the grave, of one who... He fairly choked with indignation. The professor looked pityingly at him. If I could spare you one pang, my poor friend he said. God knows I would, but this night our feet must tread in thorny baths, or later, and for ever, the feet you love must walk in paths of flame. Arthur looked up with set white face and said, Take care, sir. Take care. Would it not be well to hear what I have to say? Said Van Helsing. And then you will at least know the limit of my purpose. Shall I go on? That's fair enough, broke in Morris. After a pause Van Helsing went on. Evidently with an effort. Miss Lucy is dead. Is it not so? Yes. Then there can be no wrong to her. But if she not be dead, Arthur jumped to his feet. Good God! he cried. What do you mean? Has there been any mistake? Has she been buried alive? He groaned in anguish that not even hope could soften. I did not say she was alive, my child. I did not think of it. I go no further than to say that she might be undead. Undead? Not alive? What do you mean? Is this all a nightmare, or what is it? There are mysteries which men can only guess at, which age by age they may solve only in part. Believe me, we are now on the verge of one. But I have not done. May I cut off the head of dead Miss Lucy? Heavens and earth, no! cried Arthur, in a storm of passion. Not for the wide world will I consent to any mutilation of her dead body. 
Dr. Van Helsing, you try me too far. What have I done to you that you should torture me so? What did that poor sweet girl do that you should want to cast such dishonor on her grave? Are you mad that you speak of such things, or am I mad to listen to them? Don't dare think more of such a desecration. I shall not give my consent to anything you do. I have a duty to do in protecting her grave from outrage, and by God I shall do it. Van Helsing rose up from where he had all the time been seated, and said, gravely and sternly, my lord Galdeming, I too have a duty to do, a duty to others, a duty to you, a duty to the dead, and by God I shall do it. All I ask you now is that you come with me, that you look and listen, and if when later I make the same request, you do not be more eager for its fulfillment even than I am. Then I shall do my duty, whatever it may seem to me, and then to follow your lordship's wishes, I shall hold myself at your disposal to render an account to you, when and where you will. His voice broke a little, and he went on with a voice full of pity. But I beseech you, do not go forth in anger with me. In a long life of acts which were often not pleasant to do, and which sometimes did wring my heart, I have never had so heavy a task as now. Believe me that if the time comes for you to change your mind towards me, one look from you will wipe away all this so sad hour, for I would do what a man can to save you from sorrow. Just think, for why should I give myself so much labor and so much of sorrow? I have come here from my own land to do what I can of good, at the first to please my friend John, and then to help a sweet young lady whom, too, I come to love. For her, I am ashamed to say so much, but I say it in kindness, I gave what you gave. The blood of my veins. I gave it, who was not, like you, her lover, but only her physician and her friend. I gave her my nights and days, before death, after death, and if my death can do her good even now, when she is the dead undead. She shall have it freely. He said this with a very grave, sweet pride. And Arthur was much affected by it. He took the old man's hand and said in a broken voice, Oh, it is hard to think of it, and I cannot understand. But at least I shall go with you, and wait. End of chapter 15